Hello everyone, my name is Barrick, and this is the IRIS Project's 2017 Year in Review. IRIS stands for Autonomous Intelligent Reinforcement Interpreted Symbolism, and is an attempt at an artificial general intelligence. Last year, I tested IRIS in three unique environments. The first was a grid world puzzle game, where IRIS had to figure out a way through numerous obstacles and collect the green batteries. The second is a staple of many machine learning projects, MNIST handwritten character recognition. And the third is an information incomplete version of the puzzle game, where the view is now smaller and centered on the player character. This means that Iris has to explore and then remember the parts of the level that it can't directly see. But before we get into the results of those tests, I want to talk about how Iris works and what is reinforcement interpreted symbolism. Imagine that you're sitting in front of a computer with four unlabeled buttons. On the computer screen is this image. What's the first thing you're going to do? Push a button and see what happens. When you do, you'll observe that the character on the screen moves up. In your mind, you've assigned the concept or symbol of moving up to the cause and effect relationship between pressing the button and the character moving on the screen. You then repeat this process for the rest of the buttons. This is how we learn. We experiment with and observe the cause and effect relationships between things. Iris learns in a very similar way. To help illustrate this, alongside this demonstration, as well as most of the test footage, is a window into the mind's eye of Iris. What you're seeing are Iris's inputs, a sub-symbolic, two-dimensional array of grid values that represent the objects in the game. Think of them as simplified pixel values. To make it easier on our eyes, I've substituted those values for solid colored blocks. So when you see something like the image on the right, know that it is a human-friendly view of what's going on inside the AI's mind. Now, it doesn't yet know what any of its four actions do. So, it tries one to see what happens. It then assigns its own type of symbol to that action. And while that symbol might not make much sense to us, to it, it represents the sub-symbolic changes that occurred in its inputs when it performed that action. Then, just like we did, it continues to experiment with each action, observing those changes and assigning the relevant symbols. Once it learns what an action does, it can then imagine, or model, what the environment will look like when it performs that action. Here, it is modeling how the world will change when it uses its third action. It then performs that action and compares the result to the model that it created to make sure that everything went as planned. It can also model sequences of actions so that it can make plans to achieve whatever goals it happens to have. Every time that the results of an action match the AI's predicted model, it reinforces that symbol. However, if the AI's predicted model does not match the result of the action, it creates a new symbol that represents the new change. It then compares the subsymbolic inputs from every time that the original symbol was correct to the current subsymbolic inputs of the new symbol. It attaches the differences to each respective symbol in the form of a condition. Effectively, it's generating its own symbolic rule set from observations of its subsymbolic inputs. Now that you know how Iris works, let's see what it can do. This first clip demonstrates its ability to perform unsupervised online learning. An untrained Iris is put into the puzzle game. It's given the goal of collecting the battery, but it doesn't know how to do that. So instead, it's seeking new observations. It's trying all of its outputs in places it hasn't tried them before. For example, it's already tried moving through the door, but it learned that the door acts just like a wall. It's learned that it can collect the key, but it hasn't yet tried the door again. When it does, it observes that the door reacts differently after a key is picked up. It continues with the same type of experimentation for the rest of the levels. After having completed the levels only one time, it's learned enough about the game to be able to complete the levels again with only a few errors. It's also possible to teach Iris how the game works through indirect learning. 
By letting Iris observe a multitude of gameplay animations, it's possible to teach it how to play the game before it actually plays it. In this next clip, you'll see Iris playing the game for the first time after having only watched the gameplay animations. You'll also see the plan that Iris is able to model based only on the information that it learned from the animations. First, it models a plan for how it's going to achieve its goal. Then, as it's performing its plan, it follows along to make sure that everything goes as expected. And despite having never played the game itself, it's able to complete it with no errors. While there have been some examples of one-shot learning in the previous clips, I think it is best demonstrated with the MNIST character recognition. In the MNIST test, Iris acts as a tool rather than an agent, because there's no actions for Iris to perform. So instead of buttons, think of it as 10 indicator lights, one for each of the characters 0 through 9. Iris is first shown a character with no indicators lit, and then the correct indicator lights up. So instead of having a goal that it has to model a sequence of actions to achieve, it only has to model which indicator will light up. In this example, Iris has only been shown a 0 and a 5, and it thinks the 2 looks more like the 0 than the 5. But when it's shown the correct answer, it learns that if something looks like a 2, then the third indicator will light up. Now for the test itself. When it's shown the first image, it has no idea what the answer might be, because it's never seen an answer. When it's shown the second image, it answers with the only answer it's seen so far. With each new character shown, it learns a new potential answer. Here, it got its first answer correct, and that reinforces what it thinks a 1 looks like. For the more complex characters, it takes a little while for it to gain enough observations to be able to guess them accurately. As you can see here, it's getting better. Its best guess was a 4, but its second best guess was a 9. Unfortunately, I've only tested Iris on 2,000 images from the MNIST test dataset, and that took over 8 days on my 4-year-old i3 laptop. But here you can see how quickly its accuracy ramped up to almost 76.5%. I'm looking forward to retrying this test on better hardware so that I can show it all 60,000 images from the training data set before seeing how accurate it is on the test data set of 10,000 images. But for now, we'll move on to the next test, Information Incomplete Modeling. In this test, we're back to Iris having its own agency. It's dropped untrained into the test environment and has to explore and find the batteries, remember where they are, and then go back and plan to collect them. As it experiments with each action, it's learning how the objects on the screen are moving with each action that it takes. It soon starts to recognize that the pattern of objects on the screen are an indication of what objects will appear and disappear on the edges of the screen every time that it moves. Just there, you can see how it's starting to be able to model its way through areas that it's already been through. It doesn't take very long before it explores its way over to a battery and learns that it can collect it. Once it's fully explored the level, it can then go back and use its knowledge of how the patterns of objects on the screen correlate to its location inside the level to be able to model all of the actions necessary to collect the batteries. This test is also a good example of another feature of Iris that I call contextual memory. That means that all of Iris's knowledge is based on patterns of its sub-symbolic inputs. That means that Iris is capable of multi-domain knowledge because the pattern of inputs in the puzzle game is much different than the pattern of inputs in, say, MNIST. So knowledge about the puzzle game and knowledge about MNIST characters can seamlessly coexist in the same agent. In other words, Iris could play a level of the puzzle game, switch over to MNIST, guess a couple numbers, switch back over to the puzzle game, play another level, then switch back over to MNIST, guess a couple more numbers, and so on and so forth. Because of this, Iris is also capable of knowledge merging. The first type of merging we're going to look at is interdomain merging, which is when you have one agent trained on some aspects of a domain, and another agent trained on other aspects of the same domain. In this example, neither of these agents could complete the following level, because both agents are lacking knowledge that the other one has. 
but by combining the knowledge of both agents, we end up with an agent with all of the knowledge necessary to complete the level. The other type is cross-domain merging, where you have an agent trained on, say, the puzzle game, and another agent trained on MNIST character recognition, and you merge them together to end up with a multi-domain agent like we saw before. And that wraps up the progress made in 2017. So far this year, I've got two new test environments planned. The first is Checkers, to see how well it performs in a competitive environment. And the second is to test some theories from my recent blog article about the control problem called Friendly AI via Agency Sustainment. Thank you for watching, and for more information, visit iris-ai.com.